Hello, hello, hello! Greetings, salutations, Konnichiwa, and every other form of green across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsu Quinox. This is Horus, and welcome once again, my dear scholars, to the study. Hello there, hello there, hello there. Hello there, Dr. Zadium. Hello there, Yulian 20. Welcome. Greeting, oh great well, I, oh great one. Well, I'm not I'm not that great. I mean I'm I'm fantastic, I'm spectacular, I'm amazing, but I'm not great. I mean, if you if you want to add that to the list, feel free to do so, but you know, you know, I I'm I'm just I'm just your average amazing Beyond astonishing, Omniversal Librarian, Yulian Twenty. Yes, yes, you are. Ah, thank you, Yulian Twenty. So, how are all you fine, marvelous, wonderful scholars doing this evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you are? Dr. Zadium, doing well, good. Yulian 20, better than I could ever imagine. Oh, oh well, I can imagine a few th amazing things, but I guess that, that, that takes the cake. Mm. Oh, as for myself, well, it's been an odd day today. Um, Horace and I worked very hard in the study. Felt a little lightheaded today, I'm not sure why. Hopefully it's not a sign of anything, but, you know, I must power through for the sake of my marvelous scholars. So here I am. <laughs> I am here just for all of you, my dear scholars. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> oh, hmm. But yes, I digress. Tonight is going to be a special night. Tonight, we are finally finishing the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Bachi, 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 bachi. We are at the last three chapters. Well, technically, we're at the last two, and then there is an epilogue. But still, we are at the finale after... I don't know how long. It feels like forever. Oh, my goodness. That's the case with every long book I do. You know, ever felt like you've read a book for so long... That has become the only book that you've read. Excuse me. That's the case with this. It, it feels like we've read this for so long, I don't even remember the books I read before this. It, it's, it's, been, it's been rather crazy. But, uh, no, we are at the finale. Oh. Oh, this is, this is just should be interesting. This is, this is going to be good. Well, when I say good, I mean... Hopefully it's good because, uh, well, with this book, you, you can never tell. After all, you can never tell with any book until you've read it. But in this case, um, hopefully it's a good ending worth the read. I hope. But I digress. So, my dear scholars, um, without further ado... Should we start our reading? Or should we talk a little bit more? I mean, I've got plenty to talk about. Don't you have plenty to talk about, Horace? See, Horace has a lot of topics he's willing to talk about, if you want to hear them. Julian 20, I'm sorry. Dr. Zay reading. Oh! You don't want to hear Horace talk? Uh, Horace, did you hear that? I am shocked, Dr. Zadium, that you would not want to hear Horace give one of his many, many amazing lectures on a wide variety of topics. Horace is devastated. Well, okay, he's not so much devastated as he's peeved. Well, okay, he's not so much peeved as he's annoyed. Well, okay, he's rather ambivalent to the whole thing. Actually, he wants us to get on with the reading. So, which I, without much further ado, my dear scholars, sit back, 
relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking. And we will continue our reading of The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I better have. Yulian 20, when do we get to be merry? When it's done. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Part 8. In which it is told how Robin Hood met Guy of Gisborne in Sherwood Forest, and of the famous fight betwixt them. Also, how Little John fell into the sheriff's hands through saving the life of three men. Likewise, it is told how good King Richard of the Lion's Heart came to Nottinghamshire and visited Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest. <coughs> really? A lot of coughing tonight, I'm afraid. 1. Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne A long time passed after the great shooting match, and during that time Robin followed one part of the advice of Sir Robert Lee, to wit, that of being less bold in his comings and goings. For though mayhap he may not have been more honest, as most folks regard honesty, he took good care not to travel so far from Sherwood that he could not reach it both easily and quickly. Great changes had fallen in this time, for King Henry had died, and King Richard had come to the crown that fitted him so well through many hard trials, and through adventures as stirring as any that ever befell Robin Hood. So here's a little a fun fact for you, my dear scholars. Um, most historians agree that the reason King Henry died... Well, I don't want to use the overall... Stereotypical trope of a broken heart, but King Henry's death was exasperated by the fact that John, um, Henry's favorite, went to join his brothers in rebellion, which ended up making his health worse and proved to be the uh, end of King Henry the Second, which um, Richard and because. Um, Henry the Younger, who was Henry's co-ruler, um, had passed on in the meantime. Henry the Younger was his firstborn. That meant Richard, who was his secondborn, got the throne. But through great changes came, they did not reach to Sherwood's shades. For there Robin Hood and his men dwelled as merry as they had ever done with hunting and feasting and singing and blithe woodland sports, for was little the outside striving of the world troubled them. The dawning of a summer's day was fresh and bright, and the birds sang sweetly in a great tumult of sound. So loud was their singing that awakened Robin Hood, where he lay sleeping, so that he stirred and turned and arose. Up rose Little John also, and all the merry men then, after they had broken their fast, they set forth hither and thither upon the doings of the day. Robin Hood and Little John walked down a forest path, where all around the leaves danced and twinkled as the breeze trembled through them, and the sunlight came flickering adown. Quoth Robin Hood, I make my vow, Little John. My blood tickles my veins as it flows through them this gay morn. What sayest thou to our seeking adventures, each one upon his own account? With all my heart, said Little John, we have had more than one pleasant doing in that way, good master. Here are two paths. Take thou the one to the right hand, and I will take the one to the left, and then let us each walk straight ahead till he tumble into some merry doing or other. I like thy plan, quoth Robin. Therefore we will part here. But look thee, look thee Little John, keep thyself out of mischief. For I would not have ill befall thee for all the world. Mary, come up, 
quoth Little John, how thus thou talkest? Methinks thou art wont to get thyself into tighter coils than I am like to do. At this Robin Hood laughed. Why in sooth, Little John, said he, thou hast a blundering hard-headed way that seemeth to bring thee right side uppermost in all thy troubles. But let us see who cometh out best this day. So saying, he clapped his palm to Little, little John's, and each departed upon his way the trees quickly shutting the one from the other's sight. I need to have a little more drink of water. Robin Hood strolled onward till he came to where a broad woodland road stretched before him. Overhead, the branches of the trees laced together in flickering foli foliage, all golden where it grew thin to the sunlight. Beneath his feet the ground was soft and moist from the sheltering shade. Here in this pleasant spot the sharpest adventure that ever befell Robin Hood came upon him. For as he walked down the woodland path, thinking of naught but the songs of the birds, he came of a sudden to where a man was seated upon the mousy roots beneath the shade of a broad spreading oak tree. Robin Hood saw that the stranger had not yet caught sight of him. So he stopped and stood quite still, looking at the other a long time before he came forward. And the stranger, I wot, was well worth looking at, for never had Robin seen a figure like that sitting beneath the tree. <coughs> From his head to his feet, he was clad. Or was it? From his head to his feet, he was clad in a horse's hide, dressed with the hair upon it. Upon his head was a cowl that hid his face from sight, and which was made of the horse's skin, the ears whereof stuck up like those of a rabbit. His body was clad in a jacket made of the hide, and his legs were covered with the hairy skin likewise. Uh, interesting uh, choice of wardrobe, to say the least. By his side was a heavy broadsword and a sharp double-edged dagger. A quiver of smooth round arrows hung across his shoulders, and his stout bow, bow of yew leaned against the tree beside him. Hello, friend, cried Robin, coming forward at last. Who art thou that sittest there? And what is that that thou hast upon thy body? I make my vow I have never seen such a sight in all my life before. Had I done an evil deed thing, or did my conscience trouble me, I wouldn't be afraid of thee thinking that thou wast some one from down below, bringing a message biding me come straight away to King Nicholas. To this speech, the other answered not a word, but he pushed the coil cowl back from his head and showed a knit brow, a hooked nose, and a pair of fierce, restless black eyes, which altogether made Robin think of a hawk as he looked on his face. But beside this, there was something about the lines on the stranger's face, and his thin, cruel mouth, and the hard glare of his eyes, that made one's flesh creep to look upon. "'Who art thou, rascal?' said he at last, in a loud, harsh voice. "'Tut, tut!' quoth Merry Robin. "'Speak not so sourly, brother.' Hast thou fed upon vinegar and nettles this morning, that thy speech is so stinging? And thou likest not my word, said the other fiercely. Thou hast best be jogging, but I tell thee plainly my deeds match them. Nay, but I do like thy words, thou sweet pretty thing, quoth Robin, squatting down upon the grass in front of the other. Moreover, moreover, I tell thee thy speech is witty, and gamesome as any I have heard in all my life. The other said not a word, but he glared upon Robin with a wicked and baleful look, such as a fierce dog bestows upon a man ere it springs at his throat. Robin returned the gaze with one of wide-eyed innocence, not a shadow of a smile twinkling in his eyes or twitching at the corners of his, corners of his mouth. 
So they sat staring at one another for a long time, until the stranger broke the silence suddenly. What is thy name, fellow? said he. Now, quoth Robin, I am right glad to hear thy thee speak, for I began to fear the sight of me had stricken thee dumb. As for my name, it may be this, or it may be that. But methinks it is more meet for thee to tell me thine, seeing that thou art the greater stranger in these parts. Pray thee, tell me, sweet Chuck, why wearest thou that dainty garb upon thy pretty body? More water. At these words, the other broke into a short, harsh roar of a laugh. By the bones of the demon Odin, said he, thou art the boldest spoken man that ever I have seen in all my life. I know not why I do not smite thee down where thou sittest, for only two days ago I skewered a man over back of Nottingham Town for saying not half so much to me as thou hast done. I wear this garb, thou fool, to keep my body warm. Likewise, it is near as good as a coat of steel against a common sword thrust. That actually would make sense. I mean, um, the horse hide would probably be pretty tough, so uh, a sword would not easily pierce it. A sort of natural bulletproofing, as well, sword proofing, as it were. As for my name. I care not who knoweth it. It is Guy of Gisborne, and thou mayest have heard it before. I come from the woodlands over in Herefordshire, upon the lands of the bishop of that ilk. I am an outlaw, and get my living by hook and by crook, in a manner that boots not now to tell of. Not long since the bishop sent for me, and said that if I would do a certain thing that the sheriff of Nottingham would ask of me, he would give me a free pardon, and give me a ten score pounds to boot. So straightway I came to Nottingham Town, and found my sweet sheriff. And what thinkest thou he wanted of me? Why, forsooth to come here to Sherwood to hunt up one Robin Hood. Also an outlaw, and to take him alive or dead. It seemeth that they have no one here to face that bold fellow, and so sent all the way to Herefordshire, and to me, for thou knowest the old saying, Set a thief to catch a thief. As for the slain of this fellow, it galleth me not a whit, for I would shed the blood of my own brother for the half of two hundred pounds. You know, this is going to go on a tangent, but uh, I now have to thank this book for making sense of the title of the classic Hitchcock movie, To Catch a Thief. Now the title makes so much sense in context to what that saying is. Set a thief to catch a thief. I, I didn't think about that before. To all this Robin listened, and as he listened, his gorge rose. Well, he knew of this guy of Gisborne, and of all the bloody and murderous deeds he had done in Herefordshire, for his doings were famous throughout all the land. Yet, although he loathed the very presence of the man, he held his peace, for he had an end to serve. Truly, quoth he, I have heard of thy gentle doings. Methinks there is no one in all the world that Robin Hood would rather meet than thee. At this, Guy of Gisborne gave another harsh laugh. <laughs> Why, quoth he, is it a merry thing to think of one stout outlaw like Robin Hood meeting another stout outlaw like Guy of Gisborne? Only in this case it will be an ill happening for Robin Hood, for the day he meets Guy of Gisborne he shall die. But thou gentle merry spirit, quoth Robin, dost thou not think that mayhap this same Robin Hood may be the better man of the two? I know him right well, 
and many think that he is one of the stoutest men hereabouts. He may be the stoutest of men hereabouts, quoth Guy of Gisborne. Yet I tell thee, fellow, this sty of yours is not the wide world. I lay my life upon it. I am the better man of the two. He is an outlaw, forsooth. Why, I hear he hath never let blood in all his life, saving when he first came to the forest. Some call him a great archer, Mary. I would not be afraid to stand against him all the days of the year with a bow in my hand. Why, truly, some folk do call him a great archer, said Robin Hood. But we of Nottinghamshire are famous hands with the longbow. Even I though but a simple hand at the craft, would not fear to try a bout with thee. At these words, Guy of Gisborne looked upon Robin with wondering eyes, then gave another roar of laughter, till the woods rang. Ha! Now! quoth he. Thou art a bold fellow to talk to me in this way. I like thy spirit in so speaking up to me, for few men have dared to do so. Put up a garland, lad, and I will try a bout with thee. More water. Oh. Tut, tut, quoth Robin. Only babes shoot at garlands hereabouts. I will put up a good Nottingham mark for thee. So saying, he arose, and going to a hazel thicket not far off, he cut a wand about twice the thickness of a man's thumb. From this he peeled the bark, and sharpening the point, stuck it up in the ground. St stuck it up. No, hold on a second. I think my page is shut. Stuck. Stuck it up in the ground in front of a great oak tree. Thence he measured off four score paces, which brought him beside the tree where the other sat. There quoth he, is the kind of mark that Nottingham yeomen shoot at. Now let me see thee split that wand, if thou art an archer. Then Guy of Gisborne arose. Now out upon it, cried he. The devil himself could not hit such a mark as that. Mayhap he could, and mayhap he could not, quoth Mary Robin. But that we shall never know till thou hast shot thereat. At these words, Guy of Gisborne looked upon Robin with knit brows, but as the yeoman still looked innocent of any ill meaning, he bottled his words and strung his bow in silence. Twice he shot, but neither time did he hit the wand, missing it the first time by a span, and the second time by a good palm's breadth. Robin laughed and laughed. I see now, quoth he, that the devil himself could not hit that mark, good fellow, if thou art no better with the broadsword than art than thou art with the bow and arrow, thou wilt never overcome Robin Hood. At these words Guy of Gisborne glared savagely upon Robin. Quoth he, Thou hast a merry ton, thou villain, but take care that thou makest not too free with it, or I may cut it out from thy throat for thee. Robin Hood strung his bow, and took his place with never a word, albeit his heartstrings quivered with anger and loathing. Twice he shot, the first time hitting within an inch of the wand, the second time splitting it fairly in the middle. Then, without giving the other a chance for speech, he flung his bow upon the ground. There, thou bloody villain, cried he fiercely, let that show thee how little thou knowest of many manly sports. And now look thy last upon daylight, for the good earth hath been befouled long enough by thee, thou vile beast. This day, our lady willing, thou diest. I am Robin Hood. So saying, he flashed forth his bright sword in the sunlight. For a time, Guy of Gisborne stared upon Robin as though bereft of wits. 
but his wonder quickly passed to a wild rage. Art thou indeed, Robin Hood? cried he. Now I am glad to meet thee, thou poor wretch. Shrive thyself, for thou wilt have no time for shriving when I am done with thee. So saying, he also drew his sword. And now came the fiercest fight that ever Sherwood saw, for each man knew that either he or the other must die, and that no mercy was to be had in this battle. Up and down they fought, till all the sweet green grass was crushed and ground beneath the trampling of their heels. More than once the point of Robin Hood's sword felt the softness of flesh, and presently the ground began to be sprinkled with bright red drops albeit not one of them came from Robin's veins. At last, Guy of Gisborne made a fierce and deadly thrush at Robin Hood, from which he leaped back lightly, but in so leaping he caught his heel in a root and fell heavily upon his back. Now, Holy Mary, aid me, muttered he, as the other leaped at him with a grin of rage upon his face. Fiercely, Guy of Gisborne stabbed at the other with his great sword, but Robin caught the blade in his naked hand, and though it cut his palm, he turned the point away so that it plunged deep into the ground close beside him. Then, ere a blow could be struck again, he leaped to his feet with his good sword in his hand, and now despair fell upon Guy of Gisborne's heart in a black cloud, and he looked around him wildly like a wounded hawk. Seeing that his strength was going from him, Robin leaped forward and, quick as a flash, struck a backhanded blow beneath the sword arm. Down fell the sword from Guy of Gisborne's grasp, and back he staggered at the stroke, and ere he could regain himself, Robin's sword passed through and through his body. Round he spun upon his heel, and flinging his hands aloft with a shrill wild cry, fell prone upon his face, upon the green sod. Wow. Then Robin Hood wiped his sword, and thrust it back into the scabbard, and coming to where Guy of Gisborne lay, he stood over him with folded arms, talking to himself the while. This is the first man I have slain since I shot the king's forester in the hot days of my youth. I oftentimes think bitterly, even yet, of that first life I took. But of this, I am as glad as though I had slain a wild boar that laid waste a fair country. Since the Sheriff of Nottingham hath sent a one as this against me, I will put on the fellow's garb, and go forth to see whether I may not find his worship, and perchance pay him back some of the debt I owe him upon this score. So saying, Robin Hood stripped the hairy garments off the dead man, and put them on himself, all bloody as they were. Then, strapping the other's sword and dagger around his body, and carrying his own in his hand, together with the two bows of yew, he drew the cowl of the horse's hide over his face, so that none could tell who he was, and set forth from the forest, turning his steps toward the eastward and Nottingham Town. Braddy, oh, hello there, Braddy Chu Cthulhu. You can't just say perchance. <laughs> oh. Hello there, welcome! Glad to have you here. Enjoy the story. We are reading The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. In fact, we're going to be finishing the book tonight. Why can't I say the word perchance? Bro might as well have mayhaps instead. <laughs> I can't help what the author wrote. As he strode along the country roads, 
men, women, and children hid away from him, for the terror of Guy of Gisborne's name and of his doings had spread far and near. And now, let us see what befell Little John while these things were happening. Brady Cthulhu. Well, yeah, authors are funny. That's why I like writing. Oh, wonderful. I love writing, too. I've actually uh, wrote a book, one that got one that I self-published, um, working on two other novels, too. But it's wonderful to meet other writers. Writing is a marvelous art. It's a marvelous hobby, and it's a marvelous thing. If not for writing, we would not get stories like this. And if it was not for writing, we wouldn't get stories like that. Ready, Cthulhu. I'm working on a book, too. Wonderful! Good to hear it. Wonderful. Little John walked on his way through the forest paths until he had come to the outskirts of the woodlands, where, here and there, fields of barley, corn, or green meadowlands lay smiling in the sun. So he came to the high road and to where a little that cot that cottage stood back of a cluster of twisted crab trees, with flowers in front of it. Here he stopped of a sudden, for he thought that he heard the sound of someone in sorrow. He listened and found that, that it came from the cottage. So, turning his footsteps thither, he pushed open the wicker and entered the place. There he saw a gray-haired dame sitting beside a cold hearthstone, rocking herself to and fro and weeping bitterly. Now, Little John had a tender heart for the sorrows of other folks. So, coming to the old woman and patting her kindly upon the shoulder, he spoke comforting words to her, by bidding her cheer up and tell him her troubles, for that mayhap he might do something to ease them. At all this, the good dame shook her head, but all the same his kind words did soothe her some, somewhat. So after a while she told him all that bore upon her mind. That that morning she had three as fair tall sons beside her as one could find in all Nottinghamshire, but they were that they were now taken from her, and were like to be hanged straight away. That, want having come upon them, her eldest boy had gone out the night before into the forest, and had slain a hind in the moonlight that the king ra king's rangers had followed the blood upon the grass until they had come to her cottage, and had there found the deer's meat in the cupboard, that, as neither of the younger sons could betray, would betray their brother, the foresters had taken all three away, in spite of the oldest saying that he alone had slain the deer, that, as they went, she had heard the rangers talking among themselves, saying that the sheriff had sworn that he would put a check upon the great slaughter of deer that had been going on of late by hating the very first rogue caught thereat upon the nearest tree, and that they would take the three youths to the King's Head Inn near Nottingham Town, where the sheriff was abiding that day, there to await the return of a certain fellow he had sent into Sherwood to seek for Robin Hood. Braddy Cthulhu, I'm writing a novel. It's a romance murder mystery between a detective and a cannibal. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, how he sells, rubs hands maliciously. <laughs> well, you know, I hope it does well for you. I I really do, and I hope you um really have a lot of fun writing it. It's always important when writing anything that you enjoy yourself writing. If it if the writing becomes too much work, then you know why write. I find it interesting here also that, once again, it's important to note that back in this time of England, that there were laws concerning the hunting of animals, because every forest in England at the time was owned by the king. So if you happen to live near a forest, you could not hunt the deer, because the deer belonged to the king. Or the royals. The royals technically could hunt the deer. But you as a peasant were not allowed to hunt any deer, any wild animals in the forest. Especially deer. Um, there was a ray around it though. 
you could get a license which would say in turn that you were allowed to hunt so and so amount of deer in the forest. You could only hunt a certain amount. And that you would have permission then to go into the woods, hunt a certain amount of deer through the year or a month, depending on what the license was, and then you would not get in trouble. You would just have to show a ranger, if they caught you, you would have to show a ranger the license, and then they would let you go. In fact, that's where I believe our modern-day hunting licenses come from, is that very concept of uh, licensing. It's the same thing with fishes, of course. You would get the same sort of thing. <coughs> However, if you didn't have a license, you were in deep trouble. To all this, Little John listened, shaking his head sadly now and then. Alas, quoth he when the good dame had finished her speech, this is indeed an ill case. But who is this that goeth into Sherwood after Robin Hood, and why doth he go to seek him? But no matter for that now, only that I would I would that Robin Hood were here to advise me us. Nevertheless, no time may be lost in sending for him at this hour, if we would save the lives of thy three sons. Tell me, hast thou any clothes hereabouts that I may put on in place of these of Lincoln Green? Mary, if our stout sheriff catcheth me without disguise, I am like to be run up more quickly than thy sons. Let me tell thee, dame. Then the old woman told him that she had in the house some of the clothes of her good husband, who had died only two years before. There she brought to little John, who, doffing his garb of Lincoln green, put them on in its stead. Then, making a wig and a false beard of uncarded wool, he covered his own brown hair and beard, and putting on a great tall hat that had belonged to the old peasant, he took his staff in one hand and his bow in the other, and set forth with all the speed to where the sheriff had taken up his inn. A mile or more from Nottingham Town, and not far from the southern border borders of Sherwood Forest, stood the cozy inn bearing the sign of the King's Head. Here was a great bustle and stir on this bright morning, for the sheriff and a score of his men had come to stop there, and await Guy of Gisborne's return from the forest. Great hiss and fuss of cooking was going on in the kitchen, and great rapping and tapping of wine kegs and beer barrels was going on in the cellar. The sheriff sat within, feasting merrily of the best the place afforded, and the sheriff's men sat upon the bench before the door, quaffing ale or lay beneath the shade of the broad spreading oak trees, talking and jesting and laughing. All around stood the horses of the band, with a great noise of stamping feet and a great switching of tails. To this inn came the king's rangers, driving the widow's three sons before them. The hands of the three youths were tied tightly behind their backs, and a cord from neck to neck fastened them all together. So they were marched to the room where the sheriff sat at meat, and stood trembling before him as he scowled sternly upon them. So, quoth he in a great, loud, angry voice, ye have been poaching upon the king's deer, have you? Now I will make short work of you this day, for I will hang up thee. Well, there. Oh, thank you for the three stream streak war done. Welcome! We are at the last, we're, we're reading the last three chapters of The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Sit back and enjoy. Oh, where am I? <laughs> For I will hang up all three of you, as a farmer would hang up three crows to scare others of the kind from the field. Our fair county of Nottingham hath been too long a breeding place for such naughty knaves as ye are. I have put up with these things for many years, but now I will stamp them out once for all, and with you I will begin. 
Then one of the poor fellows opened his mouth to speak, but the sheriff roared at him in a loud voice to be silent, and bade the rangers to take them away till he had done his eating, and could attend to the matters concerning them. So the three poor youths were marched outside, where they stood with bowed heads and despairing hearts. Till after a while the sheriff came forth. Then he called his men about him, and quoth he, These three villains shall be hanged straight away, but not here, lest they breed ill luck in the, to this lest they breed ill luck to this goodly inn. We will take them over yonder to that belt of woodlands, but I would fain hang them upon the very trees of Sherwood itself, to show those vile outlaws therein what they may expect of me if I ever have the good luck to lay hands upon them. So saying, he mounted his horse, as did his men-at-arms likewise, and all together they set forth, for the belt of woodlands he had spoken of, the poor youths walking in their midst guarded by the rangers. So they came at last to the spot, and here nooses were fastened around the necks of the three, and the ends of the cords flung over the branch of a great oak tree that stood there. Brady Cthulhu, this makes me imagine Robin Hood as a D and D setting. You know that is a good question. I wonder if somewhere out there, there is a Robin Hood tabletop RPG game. You know, knowing the fact that there practically is a tabletop RPG game for everything, I would have no doubt there is one. I'm guessing Robin Hood would be a rogue class, unless there's a thief class. I'm not sure. Rogue thief. Maybe. Where was I? So they came at last to the spot, and here nooses were fast sent around the necks of the three, and the ends of the cords flung over the branch of a great oak tree that stood there. Then the three youths fell upon their knees and loudly besought mercy of the sheriff. But the sheriff of Nottingham laughed scornfully. Now! Quoth he, I would that I had a priest here to shriv you, but as none is nigh, you must e'en travel your road with all your sins packed upon your backs, and trust to St. Peter to let you in through the gates of paradise, like three peddlers into the town. <coughs> in the meantime, whilst all this had been going forward, an old man had drawn near, and stood leaning on his staff, looking on. His hair and beard were all curly and white, and across his back was a bow of yew that looked much too strong for him to draw. As the sheriff looked around, ere he ordered his men to string the three youths up to the oak tree, his eyes fell upon this strange old man. Braddy Cthulhu. Robin Hood would either be a ranger or a rogue, or maybe a multi-class. Um, maybe a multi-class. I mean, Robin Hood does have multiple talents in him. Disguise, thievery, trickery. Although, given what we've learned in this book, his intelligence might not be as high as some of them, unfortunately. He does have a tendency to run into traps rather easily. Then his worship beckoned to him, saying, Come here, the father. I have a few words to say to thee. More water. For so little John, for it was none other than he, came forward. And the sheriff looked upon him, thinking that there was something strangely familiar to the face before him. How now? said he, Methinks I have seen thee before. What may thy name be, father? Please, your worship, said Little John in a cracked voice like that of an old man. My name is Gaius Hobby at your worship's service. Gaius Hobble. Gaius Hobble. It was Gaius Hobble, not Hobby <laughs> muttered the sheriff to himself, turning over the names that he had in his mind to try to find one to fit to this. I remember not thy name, said he at last, but it matters not. 
Hast thou a mind to earn sixpence this bright morn? Aye, many, quoth Little John, for money is not so plenty with me that I should cast sixpence away, and I in I could earn it by an honest turn. What is it your worship would have me do? Why this? Here are three men that need hanging as badly as any e'er I saw. If thou wilt string them up, I will pay thee two pence apiece for them. I like not that my men at arms should, be, should turn hangmen. Wilt thou try thy hand? <coughs> in sooth, said Little John, still in the old man's voice, I ha never done such a thing before, but an a sixpence is to be earned so easily, I might as well ha it as anybody. But, your worship, are these naughty fellows shrived? <laughs> Nay, said the sh sheriff, laughing, never a wit. But thou mayest turn thy hand to that also, if thou art so minded. But hasten, I pray thee, for I would get back to mine in bed betimes. So little John came to where the three youths youth stood, trembling, and putting his face to the first fellow's cheek as though he were listening to him, he whispered softly into his ear, Stand still, brother, when thou feelst thy bonds cut. But when thou seest me throw my woolen wig and beard from my head and face, cast the noose from thy neck and run for the woodlands. Then he slyly cut the cord that bound the youth's hands, who upon his part stood still as though he were yet bound. Then he went to the second fellow and spoke to him in the same way and also cut his bonds. This he did to the third likewise but all so slyly that the sheriff, who sat upon his horse laughing, wotted not what was being done, nor his men either. Then Little John turned to the sheriff. Please, your worship, said he, will you give me leave to string my bow, for I would fain help these fellows along the way when they are swinging with an arrow beneath the ribs. With all my heart said the sheriff, only, as I said before, make thou haste in thy doings. Little John put the tip of his bow in his instep, and strung the weapon so deftly that all wondered to see an old man so strong. It takes a fair bit of strength to string a, um, a lawn bow, by the way. Um, it's not very easy. So, seeing an old man string a bow like this, um, would be something of a wonder to anyone. Next he drew a good smooth arrow from his quiver and fitted it to the, to the string. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, looking all around to see that the way was clear behind him, he suddenly cast away the wool from his head and face, shouting in a mighty voice, Run! Quick as a flash, the three youths flung the nooses from their necks and sped across the open to the woodlands as the arrow speeds from the bow. Little John also flew toward the covert like a greyhound. But while the sheriff and his men gazed after him, all bewildered with the sudden doing. But ere the yeoman had gone far, the sheriff roused himself. After him! He roared in a mighty voice, for he knew now who it was with whom he had been talking, and wondered that he had not known him before. For a little bit of a a mention for those who weren't here for earlier in the book, um, Little John at one point got himself employed by the sheriff, which is why the sheriff uh, recognizes him. Oh, hello there, Dragon Thunder 5000. Welcome. Glad to have you here. We're reading the last parts of Robin Hood. Please enjoy. Little John heard the sheriff's words, and seeing that he could not hope to reach the woodlands before they would be upon him, he stopped and turned suddenly, holding his bow as though he were about to shoot. Stand back! cried he fiercely. The first man that cometh a foot forward, or toucheth finger to bowstring, 
dieth. Brady Cthulhu, Little John the Rapper. <laughs> Although I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm wondering if he got that name from you know Little John, the uh, the Robin Hood character, because it would make it it be. I mean, who doesn't know the character? Music. <coughs> like, at these words, the sheriff's men stood as still as stocks, for they knew right well that Little John would be as good as his word, and that is to disobey him meant death. In vain the sheriff roared at them, calling them cowards, and urging them forward at to, in a body. They would not budge an inch, but stood and watched Little John as he moved slowly toward the forest, keeping his gaze fixed upon them. But when the sheriff saw his enemy thus slipping betwixt his fingers, he grew mad with his rage, so that his hands swam, and he knew not what he did. Then of a sudden he tur his head swam, and he knew not what he did. Then of a sudden he turned his horse's head, and plunging his spurs into its sides, he gave a great shout, and rising in his stirrups, came down upon Little John like the wind. Then Little John raised his deadly bow and drew the gray goose feather to his cheek. But alas for him, for ere he could loose the shaft, the good bow that had served him so long split in his hands, and the arrow fell harmlessly at his feet. Oh, bad timing. Seeing what had happened, the sheriff's men raised a shout, and following their master came rushing down upon Little John. But the sheriff was ahead of the others, and so caught up with the yeoman before he rushed, reached the shelter of the woodlands. Then, leaning forward, he struck a mighty blow. Little John ducked, and the sheriff's sword turned in his hand, but the flat of the blade struck the other upon the head, and smote him down, stunned and senseless. Now, I am right glad, said the sheriff when the men came up and found that Little John was not dead. That I have not slain this man in my haste. I would rather lose five hundred pounds than have him die, thus instead of hanging, as such a vile thief should do. Go, get some water from yonder fountain, William, and pour it over his head. The man did as he was bidden, and presently little John opened his eyes and looked around him all dazed and bewildered with the stun of the blow. Then they tied his hands behind him, and lifting him up set him upon the back of one of the horses, with his face to its tail and his feet strapped beneath its belly. Brady Cthulhu, bro wouldn't have said that if those were 500 pounds of sauce. <laughs> I suppose not, I suppose not. And lifting him up, set him upon the back of one of the horses, with his face to its tail and his feet strapped beneath its belly. So they took him back to the king's head inn, laughing and rejoicing as they went along. But in the meantime, the widow's three sons had gotten safely away and were hidden in the woodlands. Once more, the sheriff of Nineham sat within the king's head inn. His heart rejoiced within him, for he had at last done that which he had sought to do for years, taken Little John prisoner. Quoth he to himself, This time tomorrow the grogue shall hang upon the gallows tree in front of the great gate of Nottingham Town, and thus shall I make my long score with him even. So saying, he took a deep draught of canary. But it seemed as if the sheriff had swallowed a thought with his wine before he shook his head and put the cup down hastily. Now, he muttered to himself, I would not for a thousand pounds have this fellow slipped through my fingers. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Yet, should his master escape that foul guy of Gisborne, there is no knowing what he may do, for he is the cunningest knave in all the world, this same Robin Hood. Belike I had better not wait until tomorrow to hate the fellow. So saying, he pushed his chair back hastily, and going forth from the inn, called his men together. Quoth he, I will wait no longer for the hating of this rogue, but it shall be done forthwith, 
and that from the very tree which whence he saved those three young villains by stepping betwixt them and the law. So get ye ready straight away. Then once more they sat Little John upon the horse, with his face to the tail, and so one leading the horse whereat he sat, and the other riding around him. They went forward to that tree from the branches of, what, of which they had thought to hang the poachers. On they went, rattling and jingling along the road, till they came to the tree. Here one of the men spake to the sheriff of a sudden. "'Your worship!' cried he. Is it not your fellow coming along toward us, that same guy Gisborne, whom thou didst send into the forest to seek Robin Hood? At these words the sheriff shaded his eyes, and looked eagerly. Why, Cretes, quoth he, yon fellow is the same. Now heaven send that, that he hath slain the master thief, as we will presently slay the man. When Little John heard this speech, he looked up, and straightway his heart crumbled away within him, for not only were the man's garments all covered with blood, but he wore Robin Hood's bugle horn, and carried his bow and broadsword. How now? cried the sheriff, when Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne's clothes had come nigh to them. What luck hath befallen thee in the forest? Why, man, thy clothes are all over, are all over blood. And I'm trying to hold on one second. I'm going to try and think of this voice. And thou likest not my clothes, Robin in, said Robin in a harsh voice like that of Guy of Gisborne. Thou mayest shut thine eyes, many. The blood upon me is that of the vilest outlaw that ever trod the woodlands, and one whom I have slain this day. Albeit not without wound to myself. Ah, uh, well, you know, technically Robin's telling the truth, isn't he? I mean, he did kill Guy of Gisborne, one of the vilest outlaws there is. And he did get wounded, um, trying to hold the sword. Got sliced in the palm. So technically Robin is not lying. Then out spake Little John for the first time since he had fallen into the sheriff's hands. Oh, thou vile, bloody wretch! I know thee, Guy of Gisborne, for who is there that hath not heard of thee and cursed thee for thy vile deeds of blood and rapine? It is by such a hand as thine that the gentlest heart that ever beat is stilled in death. Truly thou art a fit tool for this coward sheriff of Nottingham. Now I die joyfully, nor do I care how I die, for life is not to me. So spake Little John, the salt tears rolling down his brown, brown cheeks. But the sheriff of Nineham clapped his hands for joy. Now, Guy of Gisborne, cried he, if what thou tellest me is true, it will be the best day's doings for thee that ever thou hast done in all thy life. What I have done thee is sooth, and I lie not said Robin, still in Guy of Gisborne's voice. Look, is not this Robin Hood's sword? And is not this his good bow of you? And is not this his bugle horn? Thinkest thou he would have given them to Guy of Gisborne of his own free will? Then the sheriff laughed aloud for joy. This is a good day, cried he, the great outlaw dead, and his right-hand man in my hands. Ask what thou wilt of me, Guy of Gisborne, and it is my, it is thine. Then this I ask of thee, said Robin. As I have slain the master, I would now kill the man. Give this fellow's life into my hands, Sir Sheriff. Now thou art a fool, cried the sheriff. Thou mightest have had money enough for a knight's ransom if thou hadst asked for it. I like ill to let this fellow pass from my hands, but I have promised thou shalt have him. I thank thee right heartily for thy gift, cried Robin. Take the rogue down from the horsemen, 
and lean him against yonder tree while I show you how we stick a porker whence I come. Oh my goodness, all this water. At these words, some of the sheriff's men shook their heads, for they cared not a whit whether little John was hanged or not. They hated to see him butchered in cold blood. But the sheriff called to them in a loud voice, ordering them to take the yeoman down from the horse and lean him against the tree, as the other bade. While they were doing this, Robin Hood strung both his bow and that of Guy of Gisborne, albeit none of them took notice of his doing so. Then, when Little John stood against the tree, he drew Guy of Gisborne's sharp, double-edged dagger. Fall back! Fall back! cried he. Would ye crowd so on my pleasure, ye unmanly, unmannerly knaves? Back, I say! Farthest yet! So they crowded back as he ordered, many of them turning their faces away that they might not see what was about to happen. Come, cried Little John, here is my breast. It is, <laughs> it is meet that the same hand that slew my, slew my dear master should butcher me also. I know thee, Guy of Gisborne. Oh, hello there, Private Maverick. Welcome. A lucky seventh streak. Thank you for the seventh stream streak. Wonderful. Excuse me. Peace, little John, said Robin in a low voice. Twice thou hast said thou knowest me, and yet thou knowest me not at all. Couldst thou not tell me beneath this wild beast's hide? Yonder, just in front of thee. Lie my bow and arrows, likewise my broadsword. Take them when I cut my bonds. Now, get them quickly. So saying, he cut the bonds, and Little John, quick as a wink, leaped forward and caught up the bow and arrows and the broadsword. At the same time, Robin Hood threw back the cowl of horse's hide from his face and bent Guy of Gisborne's bow with a keen barbed arrow fitted to the string. Stand back, cried he sternly. The first man that toucheth finger to bow string dieth. I have slain thy man, Sheriff. Take heed that it is not thy turn next. Then seeing that little John had armed himself, he clapped his bugle horn to his lips and blew three blasts, both loud and shrill. Now. When the sheriff of Nineham, Nineham saw whose face it was beneath Sir Guy of Gisborne's hood, and when he heard those bugle notes ring in his ear, he felt as if his hour had come. Robin Hood! roared he, and without another word he wheeled his horse in the road and went off in a cloud of dust. Pretty Cthulhu, here's my what now? Uh, what was it? Here is my breast. It is meat that same hand that slew my dear master should butcher my house. Well, I mean, a breast is a chest after all. And I mean, little John is opening his chest to be pierced by a sword. So it is accurate. It is accurate. Language has changed a bit. Julian 20, chicken. Oh, oh, sheriff's the chicken. Yes. The sheriff's men, seeing their master thus fleeing for his life, thought that it was not their business to tarry longer. So clapping spurs to their horses, they also dashed away after him. But though the sheriff of Nineham went far, fast, he could not outstrip a cloth-yard arrow. Little John twained his, bo twained his bowstring with a shout, and when the sheriff dashed in through the gates of Nineham town at full speed, a gray goose shaft struck out behind him like a mounting sparrow with one feather in its tail. For a month afterward, the poor sheriff could sit upon naught but the softest cushions that could be gotten for him. So the sheriff basically got an arrow in the butt. Um, one thing to note also, 
it sounds no well luckily I should say I should say luckily little John fired a regular arrow the f private Maverick at least it wasn't the knee <laughs> true I'll say this at least Robin didn't fire his arrow because if he had fired his arrow his arrow was a barbed arrow and the thing with barbed arrows if you don't know anything about barbed arrows is that uh, they catch in their targets. And it's very, very hard to remove them without tearing a lot. So it would have been very, very difficult to remove that arrowhead. They might have had to keep it in him if he had gotten hit with a barbed arrow. Yulian 20 liked those Amazon fish. Don't! mention that sort of thing around here. Please. <coughs> Excuse me. Thus the sheriff and a score of men ran away from Robin Hood and Little John. So that when Will Studley and a dozen or more stout yeomen burst from out of the covert, they saw not of those of their master's enemies, for the sheriff and his men were scuttling away in, a, in the distance hidden within a cloud of dust like a little thunderstorm. Then they all went back into the forest once more, where they found the widow's three sons, who ran to little John and kissed his hands. But, would not, but it would not do for them to roam the forest at large any more. So they promised that after they had gone and told their mother of their escape, they would come that night to the greenwood tree, and thenceforth become men of the band. Thus end the bravest adventures that ever befell Robin Hood and Little John. So next we shall hear how stout King Richard of the Lion's Heart visited Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest. Okay, we're going to take a little break before we start the next final two chapters. And then um, I will be right back. Right, because at least it was a triangular point bayonet. Those stab wounds were possible to... St Ooh. Sounds nasty. So I will be right back. So please, enjoy this intermission.
And we are back, my dear scholars. Oh, hello there, Kintron. Welcome. I like my rapier style style bayonets, not as much as my rapier, mind you, but still. Oh, interesting. Kintron, authors have the best words, and if we don't have the words, we make one up. Here, here. That is that is exactly truth. All right, we are going to continue with the last two sections of. Robin Hood, and they're not very long either. So, oh. two. King Richard cometh to Sherwood Forest. Not more than two months had passed and gone since these stirring adventures that have been just that have just been told of befell Robin Hood and Little John, when all nine Hampshire was a mighty stir and tumult. For King Richard of the Lion's Heart was making a royal progress through Merry England, and everyone expected him to come to Nottingham Town as in his journeying. Messengers went riding back and forth between the sheriff and the king until at last the time was fixed upon which, upon when His Majesty was to stop in Nottingham, as the guest of his worship. And now came more bustle than ever. A great running hither and thither, a rapping of hammers, a bobble of vo a, and a meh. Mike, give me a second. Give me a second. And a babble of voices sounded everywhere through the place, for the folk were building great arches across the streets, beneath which the king was to pass, and were draping these arches with silken banners and streamers of many colors. Great hubbub was going on in the guild hall of the town, also, for here a grand banquet was to be given to the king and the nobles of his train, and the best master carpenters were busy building a throne, where the king and the sheriff were to sit at the head of the table, side by side. Braddy Cthulhu, like Shablonki. 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 Sounds a wonderful word. Shablonki. It seems to many of the good folk of the place as if the days that should bring the king into the town would never come. But all the same, it did come in, in its own season, and bright shone the sun up down upon the stony streets, which were all alive with a restless sea of people. On either side of the way, great crowds of town and country folks stood packed as close together as dried herring in a box, so that the sheriff's men, halberts in hand, hands, could hardly press them back to leave space for the king's riding. Take care whom thou pushest against, cried a great burly friar to one of these men. Wouldst thou dig thine elbows into me, sir? By a lady of the fountain, and thou dost not treat me with more deference, I will crack thy name's pate for thee, even though thou must thou be one of the mighty sheriff's men. At this a great shout of laughter arose from a number of tall yeomen in Lincoln Green that were scattered through the crowd. But one that seemed to be that but, bleh, but one that seemed of more authority than the others nudged the holy man with his elbow. Peace, Tuck, said he, didst thou not promise me, ere thou camest here, that thou wouldst put a check upon thy ton? Aye, Mary, grumbled the other, but I but did not think to have a hard-footed knave trample all over my poor toes as though there were no more than so many acorns in the forest. But of a sudden all this bickering ceased, for a clear sound of many bugle horns came winding down the street. Then all the people craned their necks and gazed in the direction whence the sound came, and the crowding and the pushing and the swaying grew greater than ever. And now a gallant array of men came gleaming into sight, and the cheering of the people ran down the crowd as the fire runs in dry grass. Eight and twenty heralds in velvet and cloth of gold came riding forwards. Over their heads fluttered a cloud of snow-white feathers, and each herald bore in his hand a long silver trumpet, which he blew musically. From each trumpet hung a heavy banner of velvet and cloth of gold, 
with the royal arms of England emblazoned thereon. After these came riding five score noble knights, two by two, all fully armed, saving that their heads were uncovered. In their hands they bore oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They bore tall lances, from the tops of which fluttered pennons of many colors and devices. By the side of each knight walked a page clad in rich colors, rich clothes of silk and velvet, and each page bore in his hands his master's helmet, from which waved long floating plumes of feathers. <coughs> Never had Nottingham seen a fairer sight than those five score noble knights, from whose armor the sun blazed in dazzling light as they came riding on their great war horses, with clashing of arms and jingling of chains. Behind the knights came the barons and the nobles of the mid-country, in robes of silk and cloth of gold, with golden chains around about their necks and jewels at their girdles. Behind these again came a great array of men-at-arms, with spears and halberts at their hands, in their hands, and in the midst of these two riders side by side. One of these, one of the horsemen, was the sheriff of Nottingham in his robes of office. The other, who was a head taller than the sheriff, was clad in a rich but simple guard, garb, with a broad, heavy chain about his neck. His hair and beard were like threads of gold, and his eyes were as blue as the summer sky. As he rode along, he bowed to the right hand and the left, and a mighty roar of voices followed him as he passed. For this was King Richard. Um, actually, historically, King Richard was a redhead. He didn't have yellow hair. But, you know, let's give some leeway to the story. Then above all the tumult and the shouting, a great voice was heard roaring. Heavens and saints bless thee, our gracious King Richard, and likewise our Lady of the Fountain bless thee. Then King Richard looked up toward the spot whence the sound came, saw a tall, burly, strapping priest standing in front of all the crowd with his legs wide apart as he backed against those behind. By my soul, Sheriff, said the king, laughing, ye have the tallest priest in Nottinghamshire that ever I saw in all my life. If heaven never answered prayers because of deafness, Methinks I would nevertheless have blessings bestowed upon me, for that man yonder would make the great stone image of St. Peter rub its ears and hearken on to him. I wonder that I had an army of such as he. To this the sheriff answered never a word, but all the blood left his cheeks, and he caught at the pommel of his saddle to keep himself from falling, for he also saw the fellow that so shouted, and knew him to be Friar Tuck. And moreover, behind Friar Tuck, he saw the faces of Robin Hood, and Little John, and Will Scarlet, and Will Stutley, and Alan Adale, and others of the band. Ah, now, said the king hasty, art thou ill, Sheriff, that thou growest so white? Nay, your majesty, said the sheriff, it was not but a sudden pain that will soon pass by. Thus he spake, for he was ashamed that the king should know that Robin had feared him so little that he thus dared to come within the very gates of Nottingham Town. Thus rode the king into Nottingham Town on that bright afternoon in the early fall season, and none rejoiced more than Robin Hood and his merry men to see him come so royally on to his own. Evertide had come. The great feast in the guild hall at Nottingham Town was done, and the wine passed freely. A thousand waxen lights gleamed upon the board, along the board, at which sat lord and noble and knight and squire in goodly array. At the head of the table, upon a throne all hung with cloth of gold, sat King Richard, with the sheriff of Nottingham beside him. Quoth the king to the sheriff, laughing as he spoke, I have heard much spoken concerning the doings of certain fellows hereabouts. One Robin Hood and his band, who are outlaws and abide in Sherwood Forest. 
Canst thou not tell me somewhat of them, Sir Sheriff? For I hear that thou hast had dealings with them more than once. At these words, the Sheriff of Nineham looked down gloomily, and the Bishop of Hereford, who was present, gnawed his neither lip. Quoth the Sheriff, I can tell your majesty but little concerning the doings of those naughty fellows, save that they are the boldest lawbreakers in all the land. <coughs> then up spake yon Sir Henry of the Lay, a great favourite with the king under whom he had fought in Palestine. May it please your majesty, said he, when I was away in Palestine, I heard often times from my father, and in most cases I heard of this very fellow, Robin Hood. If your majesty would like, I will tell you a certain adventure of this outlaw. Then the king laughingly bade him tell his tale, whereupon he told how Robin Hood had aided Sir Richard of the Lay with money that he had borrowed from the bishops of Her Bishop of Hereford. Again and again the king and those present roared with laughter, while the poor bishop waxed cherry red in the face with vexation, for the matter was a sore thing with him. When Sir Henry of the Lay was done, others of those present, seeing how the king enjoyed this merry tale, told other tales concerning Robin and his merry men. "'By the hilt of my sword,' said stout King Richard, "'this is as bold and merry a knave as ever I heard tell of. "'Mary, I must take this matter in hand, and do what thou could not do. "'Sheriff, to wit, clear the forest of him and his band.' <coughs> That night, the king sat in the place that was set apart for his lodgings while at Nottingham Town. With him was young Sir Henry of the Lay, and two other knights, and three barons of Nottinghamshire. But the king's mind still dwelt upon Robin Hood. Now, quoth he, I would freely give a hundred pounds to meet this roguish fellow, Robin Hood and to see somewhat of his doings in Sherwood Forest. Let me get another drink of water. I ran out of water in the last... <sighs> then up spake Sir Hubert of Binham, laughing. If your majesty hath such a desire upon you, it is not so hard to satisfy. If your majesty is willing to lose one hundred pounds... I'll engage to cause you not only to meet this fellow, but to feast with him in Sherwood. Mary, Sir Hubert, quoth the king, this pleaseth me well, but how wilt thou cause me to meet Robin Hood? Why thus, said Sir Hubert, let your majesty and us here present, present put on the robes of seven of the Order of Black Friars. And let your majesty hang a purse of one hundred pounds beneath your gown. Then let us undertake to ride from here to Mansfield Town tomorrow. And with that I am much mistaken. We will both meet with Robin Hood and dine with him before the day be passed. I like thy plan, Sir Hubert, quoth the king merrily. And tomorrow we will try it, and see whether there be virtue in it. <coughs> So it happened that when early the next morning the sheriff came to where his liege lord was abiding, to pay his duty to him, the king told him what they had talked of the night before, and what merry adventure they were set upon undertaking that morning. But when the sheriff heard this, he smote his forehead with his fist. Alas, said he, what evil counsel is this that hath been given thee? Oh, my gracious lord and king, you know not what you do. This villain that you thus go to seek hath no reverence either for king or king's law. But I do not hear all aright when I was told that this Robin Hood hath shed no blood since he was outlawed, saving only that of that vile guy of Gisborne, for whose death all honest men should be thanked him. Yea, your majesty, said the sheriff, you have heard aright, nevertheless, then... Quoth the king, breaking in on the sheriff's speech, What have I to fear in meeting him, having done him no harm? 
Truly, there is no danger in this. But mayhap thou wilt go with us, Sir Sheriff. Nay, quoth the Sheriff hastily, heaven forbid. But now seven habits such as Black Friars wear were brought, and the king and those about him having clad themselves therein, and his majesty having hung a purse with a hundred golden pounds in it beneath his robes, they all went forth and mounted the mules that had been brought to the door for them. Then the king bade the sheriff be silent as to their doings, and so they set forth upon their way. Onward they traveled, laughing and jesting, until they passed through the open country, between bare harvest fields whence the harvest had been gathered home, through scattered glades that began to thicken as they went further farther along, till they came within the heavy shade of the forest itself. They traveled in the forest for several miles without meeting anyone such as they sought, until they had come to that part of the road that lay nearest to Newstead Abbey. By the holy Saint Martin, quoth the king, I would that I had a better head for remembering things of great need. Here have we have come away and brought never so much as a drop of anything to drink with us. Now I would give half a hundred pounds for somewhat to quench my thirst withal. <coughs> no sooner had the king so spoken than out from the cavern covered at the roadside stepped a tall fellow with yellow beard and hair and a pair of merry blue eyes truly holy brother said he laying his hand upon the king's bridle rein it were an unchristian thing to not give, in, give fitting answer to so fair a bargain we keep it in here about us and for fifty pounds we will not only give thee a good trot of wine I will give thee as noble a feast as ever thou didst tickle thy gullet withal. So saying, he put his finger to his lips and blew a shrill whistle. Oh, thank you for the follow, Braddy Cthulhu. Welcome to our little, to our pack of uh, scholars. Our group of scholars, not pack. Oh my goodness. Oh, that made me jump. <laughs> I forgot how loud that alert is. But thank you. I am Matsukunax, interdimensional omniversal librarian. This is Horace, and welcome. Brady Kasuba, are we wizards? Well, we could be. I mean, there is a certain magic in studying, and books. I mean, we have plenty of books here. Then straight away the bushes and branches on either side of the road swayed and crackled, and threescore broad-shouldered yeomen in Lincoln Green burst out of the covert. How now, fellow, quoth the king, who art thou, thou naughty, naughty rogue? Hast thou no regard for such holy men as we are? Not a whit, quoth merry Robin Hood, for the fellow was he. For in sooth all the holiness belongs to which friars, such as ye are, one could drop into a thimble, and the good wife would never feel it with the tip of her finger. As for my name, it is Robin Hood, and thou mayest have heard it before. Now out upon thee, quoth King Richard, thou art a bold and naughty fellow, and a lawless one withal, as I have often heard tell. Now pray thee let me, and these brethren of mine, travel forward in peace and quietness. I mean, in D&D, wizards have access to the Scholar Pack for their starting equipment. Well, it's hard to say if we are wizards or we're magical or anything. I mean, the study is an unusual place, let's put it that way. And we are unusual people. So, you can call yourselves wizards if you want. Uh, where was I now? Um, no, I... It may not be said Robin, for it would look but ill of us to let such holy men travel onward with empty stomachs. But I doubt not that thou hast a fat purse to pay thy score at our inn, since thou offerest freely so much for a poor draught of wine. Show me thy purse, reverend brother, or I may perchance have to strip thy robes from thee to search for it myself. Nay, use no force, said the king sternly. Here is my purse. But lay not thy lawless hands upon our person. Hut tat, 
quoth Merry Robin. What proud words are these? Art thou the king of England to talk so to me? Here, yeah. we'll take this purse and see what there is within. Will Scarlet took the purse and counted out the money. Then Robin bade him keep fifty pounds for themselves and put fifty back into the purse. This he handed to the king. Here, yeah, brother, quoth he, take this half of thy money and thank St. Martin, on whom thou didst call before, that thou hast fallen into the hands of such gentle rogues that they will not strip thee bare as they might do. But wilt thou not put back thy cowl? For I would fain see thy face. Right, because you I'm a hairy wizard. No, wait, that's not how the quote goes. <laughs> Kintron, I'm a hairy wizard. <laughs> well, I suppose you would be, Kintron. I mean, you are, well, would you be a hairy wizard or a furry wizard? That's the question. Nay, said the king, drawing back. I may not put back my cow, but we seven have vowed that we will not show our faces for four and twenty hours. Then keep them covered in peace, said Robin, and far be it from me to make you break your vows. So he called seven of his yeomen and bade them each one take a mule by the bridle. Then, turning their faces toward the depths of the woodlands, they journeyed onward until they came to the open glade and the greenwood tree. Little John, with threescore yeomen at his heels, had also gone forth that morning to wait along the roads and bring a rich guest to Sherwood Glade, if such might be his luck, for many with fat purses must travel the road at this time, when such great doings were going on in Nottinghamshire. But though Little John and so many others were gone, Firetuck and two score or more stout yeomen were seated or lying in a round beneath the great tree, and when Robin and the others came, they leaped to their feet to meet him. By my soul, quoth merry King Richard, when he had gotten down from his mule and stood looking about him, thou hast in very truth a fine lot of young men about thee, Robin. Methinks King Richard himself would be glad of such a bodyguard. These are not all of my fellows, said Robin proudly. For three score more of them are away on business with my good right hand man, Little John. But as for King Richard, I tell thee, brother, there is not a man of us all but would pour out our blood like water for him. Ye churchmen cannot rightly understand our king, but we yeomen love him right loyally for the sake of his brave doings, which are so like our own. So, one thing to note about King Richard is he actually did not care for England. At all. In fact, he is quoted as saying, maybe f a fake quote, but not sure, that he would gladly sell England if he could find a buyer. Um, he was more interested in his French lands. In fact, he didn't speak English. He spoke French. Preferred French, in fact. Um, and he spent most of his time out at war during the Crusades, um, he spent only a very, I think he only spent about a few months in England throughout his entire reign. So he really, he really wasn't a man who had a great interest in the country he ruled. Well, he had a great interest in the French lands he ruled, but not a great interest in the English lands that he ruled, or his English subjects. <coughs> Excuse me. But now Friar Tuck came bustling up. Get ye good den, brothers, said he. I am right glad to welcome some of my cloth in this naughty place. Truly, methinks these rogues of outlaws would stand but an ill chance were it not for the prayers of Holy Tuck, who laboured so hard for their well-being. Here he winked one eye slyly and stuck his tongue into his cheek. Braddy Cthulhu, you seem to like history. I have a great passion for history. History is one of my favorite subjects in the entire world. Who art thou, mad priest? said the king in a serious voice, albeit he smiled beneath his cowl. I just realized I have two open wires here, and I don't remember which one I opened. Brady Cthulhu, have you heard about the Chinese war tax? I've heard some. I've heard of some, but I'm not a great expert in such things. 
<coughs> At this, Friar Tuck looked all around with a slow gaze. Look you now, quoth he. Never let ye me hear you say again that I am no patient man. Here is a knave of a friar calleth me a mad priest, and yet I smite him not. My name is Friar Tuck, fellow. The holy Friar Tuck. Brady Cthulhu. Chinese war taxes are some 5D chess JoJo's Bizarre Adventure type of shit. <laughs> I suppose, I bet they are. I bet they are. I'll have to look into them later. I'm not really much of an expert in Chinese history, so I might have to look into that. There, Tuck, said Robin. Thou hast said it now, pray thee. Cease thy talk and bring some wine. These reverend men are thirst, and sin they have paid so richly for their score, they must e'er have the best. Friar Tuck bridled at being so checked in his speech, and nevertheless he went straight away to do Robin's bidding. So presently a great crock was brought, and wine was poured out for all the guests and for Robin Hood. Then Robin held his cup aloft. Stay, cried he, Teddy and your drinking till I give you a pledge. Here is the good King Richard of great renown, and may all his enemies to him be confounded. Then all drank the king's health, even the king himself. Methinks, good fellow, said he, thou hast drunk to thine own confusion. Never a wit, quoth merry Robin, for I tell thee that we of Sherwood are more loyal to our lord the king than those of thine order. We would give up our lives for his benefiting, while ye are content to lie snug in your abbeys and priories, let reign who will. At this the king laughed. Quoth he, Perhaps King Richard's welfare is more to me than thou wast us of, fellow. But enough of that matter. We have paid well for our fare, so canst thou not show us some merry entertainment? I have half off heard that ye are wondrous archers. Wilt thou not show us somewhat of your skill? With all my heart! said Robin. We are always pleased to show off our guests all the sport there is to be seen. As Gaffer Swathold saith, tis a hard heart that will not give a caged starling of the best. And caged starlings ye are with us. Ho, lads! Set up a garland at the end of the glade. Then, as the yeomen ran to do their master's bidding, Tuck turned to one of the mock friars. It is thou our master, quoth he with a sly wink. Whenever he cometh across some poor piece of wit, he straightway layeth on the shoulders of this gaffer Swathold, whoever he may be, so that the poor good man goeth travelling about with all the odds and ends and tuck tags and rags of our master's brain packed on his back. They spake Friar T thus spake Friar Tuck, but in a low voice so that Robin would not hear him, for he felt nettled at Robin's cutting his talk so short. Brady Cthulhu, I love when they say tally-ho, lads. <laughs> yes, indeed, that is a fun, fun word to say. Tally-ho, lads! I've read a couple of, I've read a couple of British uh, books for this, um, for these streams, and a few of them, I think I've actually said the word tally-ho. <coughs> In the meantime, the mark at which they were to shoot was set up at six four score pace distance. It was a garland of leaves and flowers, two spans in width, which same was hung about a stake in front of a broad tree trunk. There, quoth Robin, yon is a fair mark, lads. Each of you shoot three arrows thereat, and if any fellow misseth by so much as one arrow, he shall have a buffet of Will Scarlet's fist. Hearken to him, quoth Friar Tuck. Why, master, thou dost bestow buffets from thy strapping nephew, as though there were love taps from some bouncing lass. I warrant thou art safe to hit the garland thyself, or thou wouldst not be so free of his cuffing. First David of Doncaster shot, and lodged all three of his arrows within the garland. Well done, David, cried Robin. Thou hast saved thine ears from a warming this day. Next... Midge the miller, shot, and he also lodged his arrows in the garland. Then followed Wat the tinker, but alas for him, 
for one of his shafts missed the mark by the breadth of two fingers. Kintron Vagues. All you can eat. Will Scarlet Fist. Nine ninety nine. <laughs> Come hither, fellow," said Will Scarlet in his soft, gentle voice. "I owe thee somewhat that I would pay forthwith." Then Wat the Tinker came forward and stood in front of Will Scarlet, screwing up his face and shutting his eyes tightly, as though he already felt his ears ringing with the buffet. Will Scarlet rolled up his sleeves and, staying on tiptoe to give the greater swing to his arm, he struck with might and main. Woof! came his palm against the Tinker's head, and down went Stunt Wat to the grass. Heels overhead as the wooden image as the fair goes down when the skillful player throws a cudgel at it. <coughs> Is he? Then as the tinker sat up upon the grass, rubbing his ear and winking and blinking at the bright stars that danced before his eyes, the yeoman roared with mirth till the hot forest rang. As for King Richard, he laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. Thus the band shot, each in turn, some getting off scot-free, and some winning a buffet that always sent them to the grass. And now, last of all, Robin took his place, and all was hushed as he shot. The first shaft he shot split a piece from the stake on which the garland was hung. The second lodged within an inch of the other. By my Hellington, Hellingdom! said King Richard to himself, I would give a thousand pounds for this fellow to be one of my god. And now for the third time Robin shot, but alas for him, the arrow was ill-feathered, and wavering to one side, it smote an inch outside the garland. At this a great roar went up, those of the yeomen who s upon the grass rolling over and over and shouting with laughter, for never before had they seen their master so miss his mark. But Robin flung his bow upon the ground with vexation. Now out upon it, cried he. That shaft had an ill feather to it, for I felt as it left my finger. Give me a clean arrow, and I will engage to split the wand with it. At these words, the yeoman laughed louder than ever. Nay, good uncle, said Will Scarlet in his soft, sweet voice. Thou hast had thy fair chance, and hast missed thine aim out and about. I swear the arrow was as good as any that hath been loose this day. Come hither, I owe thee somewhat, I would fain pay it. Go, good master, roared Friar Tuck, and may my blessings go with thee. Thou hast bestowed these love taps of Will Scouts with great freedom. It were a pretty, and thou gottest not thine own share. It may not be, said Mary Robin. I am king here, no subject may raise hand against the king. But even our great King Richard may yield to the Holy Pope without shame, and even take a tap from him by way of penance. Therefore I will yield myself to this holy friar, who seems to be the one in authority. I will take my punishment from him. Thus saying, he turned to the king. I pray thee, brother, wilt thou take my punishing into thy holy hands? With all my heart, quoth Mary King Richard, rising f from where he was sitting, I owe thee somewhat for having lifted a heavy weight of fifty pounds from my purse. So, make room for him on the green, lads. And thou makest me tumble? quoth Robin, I will freely give thee back thy fifty pounds, but I tell thee, brother, if thou makest me not feel grass all along my back, I will take every farthing thou hast from thy boastful speech. <coughs> so be it, said the king, I am willing to venture it. Thereupon he rolled up his sleeve and showed an arm that made the yeoman stare. But Robin, with feet wide apart, stood firmly planted, waiting the other, smiling. Then the king swung back his arm, and balancing himself a moment, he delivered a buffet at Robin that fell like a thunderbolt. 
Down went Robin, headlong upon the grass, for the stroke would have felt a stone wall. Then how the yeoman shouted with laughter till her sides ached, for never had they seen such a buffet given in all their lives. As for Robin, he presently sat up and looked all around him, as though he had dropped from a cloud and had lit in a place he had never seen before. After a while, still gazing about him at his laughing yeoman, he put his fingertips softly to his ear and felt it all around it tenderly. Will Scarlet, said he, count this fellow out his fifty pounds. I want nothing more either of his money or of him. And Moran sees him and is buffeting, buffeting. I would that I had taken my dues from thee, but I verily believe he hath deafened my ear from ever hearing again. Then, while gusts of laughter still broke from the band, Will Scarlet counted out the fifty pounds, and the king dropped it back into his purse again. I give thee thanks, fellow, said he, and if thou ev eh, and if ever thou shoulderest wish for another box of the ear to match the one thou hast, come to me, and I will fit thee with it for naught. So spake the merry king, but even as he ended, there came suddenly the sound of many voices, and out from the covert burst Little John and threescore men with Sir Richard of the Lay in the mist. Across the glade they came running, and as they came, Sir Richard shouted to Robin, Make haste, dear friend, gather thy band together, and come with me. King Richard left Nottingham Town this very morning, and comes to, cometh to seek thee in the woodlands. I know not how he cometh, for it was but a rumor of this that reached me. Nevertheless, I know that it is the truth. Therefore hasten with all thy men, and come to Castle Lay, for there thou mayst lie hidden till the present danger passeth. passeth yeah. Till present danger passeth. Passeth. Passeth! I can't say this word. Passeth. Who are these strangers that thou hast with thee? Why, quoth Mary Robin, rising from the grass, these certain gentle guests that came with us from the high road over by Newstead Abbey. I know not their names, but I have become right well acquaint with this lusty rogue's palm this morning. Mary, the pre pleasure of this acquaintance hath dost me a deaf ear and fifty pounds to boot. <coughs> Sir Richard looked keenly at the tall friar, who, drawing himself up to his full height, looks, looked fixedly back at the knight. Then of a sudden, Sir Richard's cheeks grew pale, for he knew who it was they looked upon. Quickly he leaped from off his horse's back and flung himself upon his knees before the other. At this, the king, seeing that Sir Richard knew him, threw back his cowl, and all the yeomen saw his face and knew him also. For there was not one of them but had been in the crowd in the good town of Nineham, and had seen him riding side by side with the sheriff. Down they fell upon their knees, nor could they say a word. Then the king looked all around right grimly, and last of all his glance came back, and rested again upon Sir Richard of the Lay. How is it? How is this, Sir Richard? said he sternly. How darest thou step between me and these fellows? And how darest thou offer thy knightly castle the lay for a refuge to them? Wilt thou make it a hiding place for the most renowned outlaws in England? Sir Richard the lay raised his eyes to the king's face. But far be it from me, said he, to do aught that could bring your majesty's anger upon me. Yet sooner would I face your majesty's wrath than suffer aught of harm. Where am I? Aught of harm that I could stay to fall upon Robin Hood and his band, for to them I owe my life, honor, everything. Should I then desert him in his hour of need? Ere the knight had done speaking, one of the mock friars that stood near the king came forward, and knelt beside Sir Richard, and throwing back his cowl, showed the face of young Sir Henry of the Lay. Then Sir Henry grasped his father's hand and said, 
Here kneels one who hath served thee well, King Richard, and as thou knowest, hath spe stepped between thee and death in Palestine. Yet do I abide by my dear father, and here I say also that I would freely give shelter to this noble outlaw, Robin Hood, even though it brought thy wrath upon me, for my father's honour and my father's welfare are as dear to me as mine own. King Richard looked from one to the other of the kneeling knights, and at last the frown faded from his brow, and a smile twitched at the corner of his lips. Betty, Sir Richard, quoth the king, thou art a bold-spoken knight, and thy, free thy freedom of speech weigheth not heavily against this thee with me. This young son of thine taketh after his sire, both in boldness of speech and of deed. water. Sorry, my dear scholars. For, as he saith, he stepped one time betwixt me and death. Wherefore I would pardon thee for his sake, even if thou hast done more than thou hast. Rise, all of you, for ye shall suffer no harm through me this day, for it were pity that a many times should end in a manner as to mar its joyousness. Then all arose, and the king beckoned Robin Hood to come to him. How now, quoth he, is thine, eye, is thine ear still too deaf to hear me speak? Mine ears would be deaf and in death ere they, they would cease to hear your majesty's voice, said Robin. As for the blow that your majesty struck me, I would say that, though my sins are happily many, methinks they had been paid up in full thereby. Thinkest thou so? said the king with somewhat sternness in his voice. Now I tell thee that but for three things to wit. My mercifulness, my mercifulness, my love for a stout woodsman, and the loyalty thou hast avowed for me. Thine ears, mayhap, have been more rightly, more tightly closed than ever a buffet from me could have shut them. Talk not lightly of thy sins, good Robin. But come, look up. Thy danger is past. For hereby I give thee and all thy band free pardon. Oh, that that's wonderful. So he basically pardoned Robin of all his crimes, and all of them. So they're no longer outlaws. But in sooth, I cannot let you roam the forest as ye have done in the past. Ah, oh, they have to leave Sherwood. Therefore I will take thee at thy word, when thou didst say thou would give thy service to me, and thou shalt go back to London with me. We will take that bold knave, Little John, also, and likewise thy cousin, Will Scarlet, and thy minstrel, Eleanor Dale. As for the rest of thy band, we will take their names and have them duly recorded as royal rangers. For methinks it were wiser to have them changed to law-abiding caretakers of our dear and Sherwood, than to leave them to run as large as outlawed slayers thereof. But now, get a feast ready. I would see how ye live in the woodlands. So, as I mentioned, a ranger even back then was someone who was in charge of the forest. So they would be the person who would look out for people who were shooting the king's deer, some poachers, that sort of thing. And they would arrest them. So Robin bade his men make ready a great feast, a grand feast. And straightway great fires were kindled and burned brightly, at which fires savory things roasted sweetly. While this was going forward, the king bade Robin call Alan a Dale, for he would hear him sing. So word was passed for Alan, and presently he came, bringing his harp. Oh, it's going to have lots of Mary, said King Richard, if thy singing match thy looks as it is fair enough, pray thee, strike up a ditty. Let us have a taste of thy skill. Sorry. Another drink. Mm. 
now we have a song to sing, my dear scholars. Yep, Matsu's gonna sing. Then Alan touched his harp lightly, and all words were hushed while he sang thus. Let me see if I can get a tune. This sounds a little more trickier than I thought. Give me a little bit. This song is going to be tough. It doesn't really have a... Looking at the song, it's going to be a little tough to sing because it doesn't really have a clear pattern to the rhythm. So it might sound a bit odd. Oh, where have thou been, my daughter? Oh, where hast thou been this day? Daughter, my daughter... Oh, I have been to the riverside, where the waters lie all gray and wide, and the gray sky broods o'er the leaden tide, and the shrill wind sighs a straining. What sawest thou there, my daughter? What sawest thou there this day, daughter, my daughter? Oh, I saw a boat coming, drifting nigh, Where the quivering rushes hiss and sigh, And the water so that gurgles by, And the shrill wind sigh a-straining. What sailed in the boat, my daughter? What sailed in the boat this day? Daughter, my daughter, Oh, there was one all clad in white, And about his face hung a pallid light, And his eyes gleamed sharp like the stars at night, And the shrill wind sighed a stay straining. Oh, what said he, my daughter? What said he thee this day? Daughter, my daughter, Oh, said he not, but did he thus, thrice on my lips, did he press a kiss, and my heart strings shrunk with an awful bliss, and the shrill wing sighed a straining. Oh, while growest thou so cold, ah, while growest thou so cold, my daughter, while growest so cold and white, Daughter, my daughter, oh, never a word the daughter said, but she sat all straight with a drooping head, for her heart was still and her face was dead, and the shrill wind sighed a straining. What a horrible song to sing to the king! Oh my goodness! The poor woman died at the end. <coughs> Excuse me. For goodness, for goodness' sake, is that that that's awful entertainment? You might as well show him the movie Saw. Jeez. All listened in silence, and when Alan Adale had done King Richard, and when Alan Adale had done, King Richard heaved a sigh. By the breath of my body, Alan, quoth he, thou hast a wonderful sweet voice that is strangely moves my heart. But what doleful ditty? Is this for the lips of a stout yeoman? I'd rather hear thee sing a song of love and battle than a sad thing like that. 
Moreover, I understand it not. What meanest thou by the words? I know not, your majesty, said Alan, shaking his head. For oftentimes I sing that which I do not clearly understand mine own self. Well, well, quoth the king, let it pass, only I tell thee this, Alan. Thou shalt turn thy sons to such matters as I spoke of, to wit, love or war. For in sooth thou hast a sweeter voice than Blondel, and we thought he was the best minstrel that I ever heard. But now one came forward and says that the feast was ready. So Robin Hood brought King Richard and those with him to where it lay all spread out fair, where it lay all spread out on fair white linen cloths, which lay upon thy, the soft green grass. Then King Richard sat him down and feasted and drank, and when he was done, he swore roundly that he had never sat at such a lusty repast in all his life. That night he lay in Sherwood Forest, upon a bed of sweet green leaves. And early the next morning he set forth from the woodlands for Nineham Town, Robin Hood and all his band going with him. You may guess what a stir there was in the good town when all these famous outlaws came marching to the streets. As for the sheriff, he knew not what to say, nor where to look when he saw Robin Hood in such high favor with the king, while all his heart was filled with gall because of the vexation that lay upon him. The next day... The king took leave of Nineham Town. So Robin Hood and Little John and Will Scarlet and Alan a Dale shook hands with all the rest of the band, kissing the cheeks of each man and swearing that they would often come to Sherwood and see them. Then each mounted his horse and rode away in the train of the king. Music. <coughs> Thus end the merry adventures of Robin Hood. For in spite of his promise, he was many a year ere he saw Sherwood again. After a year or two at court, Little John came back to Nottinghamshire, where he lived in an orderly, orderly way, orderly way, though within sight of Sherwood, and where he achieved great fame as the champion of all England with the quarterstaff. Will Scarlet, after a time, came back to his own home whence he had been driven by his unlucky killing of his father's steward. The rest of the band did their duty as royal rangers right well. But Robin Hood and Alan a Dale did not come again to Sherwood so quickly, for thus it was. Robin, through his great fame as an archer, became a favorite with the king, so that he speedily rose in rank to be the chief of all yeomen. At last the king, seeing how faithful and how loyal he was, created him Earl of Huntington. So Robin followed the king to the wars, and found his time so full that he had no chance to come back to Sherwood for even so much as a day. As for Alan Adale and his wife, the fair Ellen, they followed Robin Hood and shared in all his ups and downs of lives. Thus, all things have to end. But not such a lucky ending as befell Robin Hood and his band of stout yeomen, in famous Sherwood Forest. So, my dear scholars, shall we read the epilogue, the ending of Robin Hood? Primaric, my first act is Sherlocksley. I name Achu as the new sheriff of Nottingham. <laughs> Again, I have to see that movie sometime. I have not seen that movie in a long time. <coughs> Alright then. Epilogue. Telling how Robin Hood came back again to Sherwood Forest. And how Sir William Dale was sent against him to take him. Likewise, it is told how Robin Hood died by the treachery of his cousin, the prioress of the nunnery of Kirklees. Now, dear, and now, dear friend, you who have journeyed with me in all these merry doings, I will not bid you follow me further, but will drop your hand here with a 
good den, if you wish it. For that which cometh hereafter speaks of the breaking up of things, and shows how joys and pleasure that are dead and gone can never be set upon their feet to walk again. I will not dwell upon the matter over long, but will tell as speedily as may be of how that stout fellow, Robin Hood, died as he had lived, not at court as Earl of Huntington, but with bow in hand, his heart as the, in the greenwood, and he himself a right yeoman. King Richard died upon the battlefield, in such a way as properly became a lion-hearted king, as you yourself no doubt know. If you want to know how King Richard died, it was not on the battlefield, as you know. He was trying to siege a, siege a castle during a rebellion against him, and he got shot in the eye by a young boy who was defending the castle. He did not die nobly, let's put it that way. <laughs> so after a time, the Earl of Huntington, or Robin Hood as we still call him as of old, finding nothing for his doing abroad, came back to Merry England again. With him came Alan a Dale and his wife, the fair Ellen, for these two had been chief of Robin's household ever since he had left Sherwood Forest. It was in the springtime when they landed once more on the shores of England. The leaves were green, and the small birds sang blithely, just as they used to do in fair Sherwood when Robin Hood roamed the woodland shades with a free heart and a light heel. All the sweetness of the time and the joyousness of everything brought back to Robin's mind his forest life, so that a great longing came upon him to behold the woodlands once more. So he went straight away to King John, and besought leave of him to visit Nottingham for a short season. The king gave him leave to come and to go, but bade him not stay longer than three days at Sherwood. So Robin Hood and Allen a Dale set forth without delay at Nottinghamshire, and Sherwood Forest. The first night they took up their inn at Nottingham Town, yet they did not go to pay their duty to, sh to the sheriff, for his worship bore many a bitter grudge against Robin Hood, which grudges had not been lessened by Robin's rise in the world. The next day at an early hour they mounted their horses and set forth for the woodlands. As they passed along the road it seemed to Robin that he knew every stick and stone that his eyes looked upon. Yonder was a path that he had oftentimes trod of a me mellow evening, with little John beside him. Here was one now nigh choked with brambles, along which he and a certain little band had walked when they went forth to seek a certain curtal friar. Look, Alan, cried Robin, dost thou not see the scar on yonder beechen tree? That was made when thine arrow stripped away a piece of the bark the day thy staff shaft missed the noble heart so sadly. That was the same day that we were caught by the storm and had to lodge overnight at the old farmer's house, he who had the three buxom daughters. Thus they rode slowly onward, talking about these old familiar things, old and yet new, as they found more in them that they had ever thought of before. Thus at last they came to the open glade and the broad, wide-spreading greenwood tree which was their home for so many years. Neither of the two spoke when they stood beneath that tree. Robin looked all about him at the well-known things, so like what they used to be, and yet so different. For where was once the bustle of many busy fellows was now the quietness of solitude. And as he looked, the woodlands, the greensward, and the sky all blurred together in his sight through salt tears. For such a great yearning came upon him. As he looked on these things, as well known to him as the fingers of his right hand, that he could not keep back the water from his eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. That morning he had slung his good old bugle horn over his shoulder, and now with the yearning came a great longing to sound his bugle once more. He raised it to his lips. He blew a blast. Trilla. 
how I'm trying to, how do you do over here? The sweet, clear notes went winding down the forest paths, coming back again from the more distant bosky shades and faint echoes of sound. Until it faded away and was lost. Now it chanced on that very morn, Little John was walking through a spur of the forest upon certain matters of business, and as he paced the lawn, sunk in meditation, the faint, clear notes of a distant bugle horn came to his ear. As leaps the stag when it feels the arrow at its heart, so leaped Little John when that distant sound met his ear. All the blood in his body seemed to rush like a flame into his cheeks as he bent his head and listened. Again came the bugle note, thin and clear, and yet again it sounded. Then Little John gave a great wild cry of yearning, of joy and yet of grief, and putting down his head he dashed into the thicket. Onward he plunged, crackling and rending as the wild boar rushes through the underbrush. Little wrecked of he of thorns and briars that scratched his flesh and tore his clothing, for all he thought of was to get by the shortest way to the greenwood glade whence he knew the sound of the bugle horn came. <coughs> Out he burst from the covert, at last a shower of little broken twigs falling about him, and without passing a moment rushed forward and flung himself at Robin's feet. Then he clasped his arms around his master's knees, and all his body was shaken with great sobs. Neither could Robin nor Alan a Dale speak, but stood looking down at little John, the tears rolling down their cheeks. While they thus stood, seven royal rangers rushed into the open glade and raised a great shout of joy at the sight of Robin, and at their head was Will Stutley. Then after a while came four more panting with their running, and two of these four were Will Scatlock and Midge the Miller, for all these had heard the sound of Robin Hood's horn. All these ran to Robin and kissed his hands and his clothing with great sound of weeping. After a while Robin looked around him with tears dim, tear dimmed eyes and said in a husky voice, Now I swear that never again will I leave these dear woodlands. I have been away from them and from you too long. Now do I lay by the name of Robert, Earl of Huntington, and take up, take upon me once again their no, that nobler title, Robin Hood, the Yeoman. At this a great shout went up, and all the yeomen shook out one another's hands for joy. The news that Robin Hood had come back again to dwell in Sherwood as of old spread like wildfire, all over the countryside, so that ere a shen, shen knight had passed, nearly all of his old yeomen had gathered about him again. <coughs> but when the news of all this had reached the ears of King John, he swore both loud and deep and took a solemn vow that he would not rest until he had Robin Hood in his power, dead or alive. Now there was present at court a certain knight, Sir William Dale, as gallant a soldier as ever donned harness. Sir William Dale was well acquainted with Sir Wood Forest, for he was head keeper over that part of it that lay nigh to good man's field town. So to him the king turned and bade him take an army of men and go straightway to seek Robin Hood. Likewise the king gave Sir William his signet ring to show to the sheriff that he might raise all his armed men to aid the others in their chase of Robin. So Sir William and the sheriff set forth to do the king's bidding, bidding, and to search for Robin Hood, and for seven days they hunted up and down, yet found him not. Now had Robin Hood been as peaceful as of old, everything might have ended in smoke, as other such ventures had always done before. But he had fought for years under King Richard, and it was changed from what he used to be. It galled his pride to thus flee away from those, be, be, flee away before those sent against him, as a chase fox flees from the hounds. So thus it came about at last that Robin Hood and his yeomen met Sir William and the sheriff and their men in the forest, and a bloody fight followed. 
The first man slain in that fight was the Sheriff of Nottingham, for he fell from his horse with an arrow in his brain ere half a score of shafts had been sped. Many a better man than the Sheriff kissed the sod that day. But at last, Sir William Dale being wounded and most of his men slain, he withdrew, beaten, and left the forest, and left the forest. But scores of good fellows were left behind him, stretched all stiff beneath the sweet green boughs. But though Robin Hood had beaten off his enemies in fair fight, all this lay heavily upon his mind. So he brooded over it, until a fever seized upon him. For three days it held him, and though he strove to fight it off, it was, he was forced to yield at last. Thus it came that on the morning of the fourth day he called Little John to him, and told him that he could not shake the fever from him, and that he would go to his cousin, the prioress of the nunnery near Kirk Lees in Yorkshire, who was a skilled leech. They, they mean someone who works with leeches, not a literal leech, although that would be interesting. And he would have her open a vein in his arm and take a little blood from him for the bettering of his health. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he bade Little John make ready to go also, for he might perchance need aid in his journeying. So Little John and he took their leave of the others, and Robin Hood bade Will Stutley be captain of the band until they should come back. Thus they came by easy stages and slow journeying, until they reached the nunnery of Kirkley's. <coughs> Excuse me. Now Robin had done much to aid this cousin of his, for it was through King Richard's love of him that she had been made prioress of the place. But there is not in the world so easily forgotten as forgot his gratitude. So, when the prioress of Kirkley's had heard how her cousin, the Earl of Huntingdon, had thrown away his earldom and gone back again to Sherwood. She was vexed to the soul and feared lest her cousinship with him should bring the king's wrath upon her also. Thus it happened that when Robin came to her and told her how he wished her services as leech, she began plotting ill against him in her mind, thinking that by doing evil to him she might find favor with his enemies. Nevertheless, she kept this well to herself and received Robin with seeming kindness. She led him up the winding stone stair to a room which was just beneath the eaves of a high round tower, but she would not let Little John come with him. So the poor yeoman turned his feet away from the door of the nunnery and left his master in the hands of the, of the women. But though he did not come in, neither did he go far away. For he laid down in a little glade nearby, where he could watch the place the robin abided, like some great faithful dog turned away from the door where his master had entered. <coughs> Excuse me. After the women had gone, had gotten Robin Hood to the room beneath the eaves, the prioress sent all of the others away. Then, taking the little cord, she tied it tightly about Robin's arm, as though she were about to bleed him. And so she did bleed him. But the vein she opened was not one of those that lie close and blue beneath the skin. Deeper she cut than that, for she opened one of those veins through which the bright red blood runs leaping from the heart. In other words, she opened an artery. Of this Robin knew not, for though he saw the blood flow, it did not come fast enough to make him think that there was anything ill in it. Having done this vile deed, the prioress turned and left her cousin, locking the door behind her. Healing 20, oh my god, o OMG, what a, yes she is, she absolutely is. <coughs> All that live long day, the blood ran from Robin Hood's arm, nor could he check it, though he strove in every way to do so. Again and again he called for help, but no help came, for his cousin had betrayed him, and Little John was too far away to hear his voice. So he bled and he bled until he felt his strength slipping away from him. Then he arose, tottering and burying himself by the palm of his hands against the wall. He reached his bugle horn at last. 
Thrice he sounded it, but weakly and fainty, faintly, for his, breath, yeah, for his breath was fluttering through sickness and loss of strength. Nevertheless, Little John heard where he lay in the glade, and with a heart all sick with dread, he came running and leaping toward the nunnery. Loudly he knocked at the door, and in a loud voice shouted for them to let him in. But the door was of a massive oak, strongly barred and strutted with spikes. So they felt safe, and bade Little John be gone. Then Little John's heart was mad with grief and fear for his master's life. Wildly he looked about him, and his sight fell upon a heavy stone mortar, such as three men could not lift nowadays. Little John took three steps forward, and bending his back, heaved the stone mortar up from where it stood deeply rooted. Staggering under its weight, he came forward and hurled it crashing against the door. In burst the door, and away fled the frightened nuns, shrieking at his coming. Then Little John strove in, and never a word said he, but up the winding stone steps he ran till he reached the room where his master was. Here he found the door locked also, but putting his shoulder against it, he burst the locks as though they were made of brittle ice. One second, scholars. I have to do a quick intermission, just a quick one. I'll be right back. That is what we call, my dear scholars, a cliffhanger. <coughs> there he saw his own dear master, leaning against the gray stone wall, his face all white and drawn, and his head swaying to and fro with weakness. Then, with a great wild cry of love and grief and pity, Little John leaped forward and caught Robin Hood in his arms. Up he lifted him, as a mother lifts her child, and carrying him to the bed, laid him tenderly thereon. And now the prioress came in hastily, for she was frightened at what she had done, and dreaded the vengeance of Little John and the others of the band. Then she staunched the blood by cunning bandages, so that it flowed no more. All the while, Little John stood grimly by, and after she had done, he had sternly bade her be gone, and she obeyed, pale and trembling. Million twenty, I weep. This is a really, really sad scene. <coughs> then after she had departed, Little John spake cheering words, laughing loudly, and saying that all this was a child's fright, and that no stout yeoman would die at the loss of a few drops of blood. Why? Quoth he, Give thee a say night, and thou wilt be roaming the woodlands as boldly as ever. But Robin shook his head and smiled faintly where he lay. Mine own dear little John, whispered he, Heaven bless thy kind rough heart. 
But dear friend, we will never roam the woodlands together again. I, but we will, quoth Little John loudly. I, I say again, I, out upon it, who dares say that any more harm shall come upon thee? Am I not by? Let me see who dares touch. Here he stopped of a sudden, for his words choked him. At last he said in a deep, husky voice, Now, if aught of harm befalls thee because of this day's doing, I swear by St. George that the red cock shall crow over the roof tree of this house, for the hot flames shall lick every crack and cranny thereof. As for these women, here he ground his teeth, it'll be a new day for them. But Robin Hood took Little John's rough brown fist in his white hands and chided him softly in his low, weak voice, asking him since what time Little John had thought of doing harm to women, even in vengeance. Thus he talked till at last the other promised in a choking voice that no ill should fall upon the place, no matter what happened. Then a silence fell. And Little John sat with Robin Hood's hand in his, gazing out of the open window, ever and anon swallowing a great lump that came in his throat. <coughs> Meanwhile, the sun dropped slowly to the west, till all the sky was ablaze with a red glory. Then Robin Hood, in a weak, faltering voice, bade Little John raise him that he might look out once more upon the woodlands. So the omen lifted him in his arms as he bade, and Robin Hood's head lay on his friend's shoulder. Lawn he gazed with a wide, lingering look. While the other sat with bowed head, the hot tears rolling one after another from his eyes and dripping upon his bosom, for he felt that the time of parting was near at hand. Then presently Robin Hood bade him strain his stout bow for him, and choose a smooth, fair arrow from his quiver. Thus Little John did, though without disturbing his master or rising from where he sat. Robin Hood's fingers wrapped lovingly around his good bow. He smiled faintly when he felt it in his grasp. Then he knocked the arrow on that part of the string that the tips of his fingers knew so well. Little John, said he, Little John, my own dear friend, and him I love better than all others in the world. Mark, I pray thee, where this arrow lodges, and there let my grave be digged. Lay me with my face toward the east, little John, and see that my resting place be kept green, and that my weary bones be not disturbed. As he finished speaking, he raised himself of a sudden and sat upright. His old strength seemed to come back to him, and drawing the bowstring to his ear, he sped the arrow out of the open case, case, casement. As the shaft flew, his hand sank slowly with the bow, till it lay across his knees. And his body likewise sank back again into Little John's loving arms. But something had sped from that body, even as the winged arrow sped from the bow. For some minutes, Little John sat motionless. But presently, he laid that which he held gently down. Then folding the hands upon the breast and covering up the face, he turned upon his heel and left the room without a word or a sound. Upon the steep stairway he met the prioress and some of the chief among the sisters. To them he spoke in a deep, quivering voice and said he, And ye go within a score of feet of yonder room. I will tear down your rookery over your heads, 
so that not one stone shall be left upon another. Bear my words well in mind, for I mean them. So saying, he turned and left them, and they presently saw him running rapidly across the open, through the falling of the dusk, until he was swallowed up by the forest. <coughs> The early gray of the coming morn was just beginning to lighten the black sky toward the eastward, when Little John and six more of the band came rapidly across the open toward the nunnery. They saw no one, for the sisters were all hidden away from sight, having been frightened by Little John's words. Up the stone stair they ran, and a great sound of weeping was presently heard. After a while this ceased and then came the scuffling and shuffling of men's feet as they carried a heavy weight down the steep and winding stairs. So they went forth from the nunnery, and as they passed through the doors thereof, a great loud sound of wailing arose from the glade that lay all dark in the dawning, as though many men, hidden in the shadows, had lifted up their voices in sorrow. Thus died Robin Hood at Kirkley's nunnery in fair Yorkshire, with mercy in his heart towards those that had been his undoing. For thus he showed mercy for the erring and pity for the weak through all the time of his living. His yeomen were scattered henceforth, but no great ill befell them thereafter. For a more merciful sheriff and one who knew them not so well succeeding the one that had gone. And they, being separated here and there throughout the countryside, they abided in peace and quietness, so that many lived to hand down these tales to their children and their children's children. A certain one saith that upon a stone at Kirkley's is an old inscription. This I give in the ancient English in which it was written, and thus it runs. Here underneath this little sten lies Robin, Earl of Huntington, ne archer ver as ear sen good, and people could im Robin Hood, sick outlaws as he and is men, via England neder sig again. Obit twenty four cal de Cambres twelve forty seven. And now, dear friends, we must also, we also must part, for our merry journeyings have ended, and here, at the grave of Robin Hood, we turn, each going his own way. Finis. The End. And thus ends the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. I will say that final chapter made up for all the weaknesses in the book. That was fantastic for an ending. Julian 20, not very merry. No, it isn't a very merry ending. And they almost never include that ending in almost every media adaptation of Robin Hood. But it, um, but yes, it, it is, it is a very emotional ending, and I applaud them for doing an ending like that. It is fantastic. It is sad, really sad, but it's written so emotionally, so fantastically emotional. So, it is very late. Um, so next week, if, depending on everything, if everything goes according to plan, next week... <laughs> we'll be um, continuing um, I believe what is next week it's next week let me see um, I don't think it's October yet so next week I believe we'll be continuing with a little to the left if everything goes going to plan and then next Thursday 
we'll be starting Spooky Month, which means short story streams, ghost stories, scary stories, all manner of frightful spooky tales, which I am so looking forward to. We're going to be starting it off with the ghost stories of Edith Warrington, whom I've always wanted to read. So look forward to that. Um, and we might start another day of streaming, but that is a maybe. So then, let's see if there's anyone we could raid tonight after our fair reading. There is, in fact, a new category, my dear scholars, for readers. So it might be interesting to... Uh... Oh! In fact, let us raid Dear Kintron. He, it looks like he is streaming tonight with some more Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. So, my dear scholars, I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Till we meet each other again at the study, take care, and I shall see you next time. Till then, farewell and bye-bye.